want to get you thinking about is the world definitely needs all the different kinds of minds because different ways of thinking um, give you a lot of variety and better ways of solving problems. Now, I want you to think about these two really super important innovators, Steve Jobs and Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein had no speech until age three. In a lot of educational systems, he'd be labeled autistic. Steve Jobs was bullied. I was bullied in school too. And the only places where I was not bullied was where I had friends through shared interests. And for me in high school, it was horses and it was electronics. But both of these people, if they were young children today, in a lot of school systems would probably be labeled autistic, dyslexic, or some other label. Now, Thomas Edison, another one of our great inventors in the US, is the inventor of the light bulb. He was a high school dropout. His mother homeschooled him. He was labeled hyperactive and uh, probably had autism. One of the things that um, Edison did is he memorized every street in his town. That kind of sounds kind of autistic. Now, one thing that helped him is he learned to work at a young age. He was selling newspapers at a very, very young age. And one of the big problems I see today, a lot of kids with the labels are not learning working skills. And I'm seeing a lot of grandfathers come up to me, grandfathers that maybe were NASA space scientists and helped on our moon program, going to the moon, one of the greatest things our generation ever did, my generation. And that grandfather is finding out that he was probably autistic when the kids get diagnosed. And he was a NASA space scientist to help us uh, get to the moon. Now, Jane Goodall is another interesting person. Um, she only had a two year secretarial degree when she did her famous study. Would that be possible today? You know, I get concerned about academic um, barriers of entry. Steven Spielberg, he was dyslexic. He actually got rejected from a top film school because he had poor grades. But one of the things that helped um, Steven Spielberg to be uh, successful is when he was a child, he was given a movie camera. So he got exposed to movies when he was really young. People asked me how I got involved in the cattle industry. I got involved in it because when I was a teenager, I got exposed to it. Students get interested in things they get exposed to. And we got to get students out doing a lot of things. I see a lot of kids growing up today. They've never used tools. They're totally removed from the world of the practical. I think that's a gigantic mistake. My next slide on the different types of thinking. It's one of my most important slides. I am a visual thinker or an object visualizer. Everything I think about is a picture. And I just discussed that years ago in my book, Thinking in Pictures which is available in the UK from Bloomsbury. And being a visual thinker helped me in my work with livestock because you wanna understand animals, you've got to get away from verbal language. I absolutely could not do algebra. Now, another kind of thinker might also be on the autism spectrum is the visual spatial mathematical thinker. So you have a person who thinks in photorealistic pictures, then you got a person who thinks more in patterns, the more mathematical, kind of thinking. And these are the people who be good at computer programming. We need to be taking the th thing that a child's good at and build on it. And then you've got another type of thinker. They think totally in words. They also tend to be very linear, where visual thinkers like me tend to be associative. I'm learning more and more about how to communicate with people that are um, uh, they don't think the same way I do. So the first step is understanding that you think differently. Because when I was real young, I thought everybody was a visual thinker. I didn't know my, my thinking was different. And then when I was in my late 30s, I started learning that my thinking was different. Now I'm going to show you some brain scans. And this first brain scan shows um, a big, huge visual thinking circuit. This is a slice right through my head, right through here with a brain scan. And the next slide shows a slice right through here. You can see another big visual thinking circuit. And then a third slide shows some abnormalities in the left hemisphere. And this explains <clears throat> why I have no working memory. But here's a hint that can help people that are different. Do not load working memory. Multitasking on a busy takeout fast food window, probably not be a very good job for me. Uh, I, when I was a little kid, <clears throat> it took me time, <coughs> it 
time to respond on my speech. I cannot remember long strings of verbal information. So for tasks that involve sequence, I'm going to be a whole lot better if I have a pilot's checklist. Now, I get asked all the time, this next slide shows, how do you determine what kind of thinker a kid is? Well, the visual thinkers, when they're in primary school, they're going to be good at art. They may also be really good at building things. So take that ability in art and build on it, build on it. The mathematical thinkers might be good at math. Well, then you need to take in the child and give them more difficult math. And then the verbal thinkers tend to like writing. And so let's take the thing the kid's good at and build on it. That's really, really important. Now, unfortunately, there's still quite a lot of problems with discrimination out there. When I started out in the 70s, uh, being a woman in the man's cattle industry, that was a bigger barrier than autism ever was. And I was just um, reading material from Sienna. She's a, st a student in the UK, very, very good at math. You know, went to top math things, went to top math school and was treated very badly there. No, that is absolutely not right. And today in the cattle industry, the cattle industry is welcoming women but maybe in math, we need to get a little more welcoming. Let's talk about some famous women in math. Katherine Johnson, and she calculated all the trajectories for our first spacecraft to help us get to the moon. And Grace Murray Hopper, who invented the very, very first computer programming. Now, these people often get forgotten. They're just getting recognized today. Now, the next slide shows my grandfather's um, autopilot. My grandfather and another person, person who was probably autistic, was uh, the co-inventor for the autopilot for airplanes. And three little coils, you could sense which way the plane was going. People in aviation thought it was crazy, but autopilot for airplanes was basically invented um, by a traditional MIT trained engineer, that was my grandfather, and another person who had this crazy idea. And, and uh, it was in every plane in World War II. But the thing that is sad, is the stolen version was in most of the planes World War II, stolen by the Bendix Corporation. But my grandfather did get compensation at the end of the war and it went into tons of uh, commercial planes. Now you look at this autopilot and it looks pretty simple, but sometimes simple things really work. Now the next slide just shows the classes we need to be keeping in the schools. We've taken all the hands-on classes out of the schools. We need to be putting those classes back in. The other thing is there's a study that shows arts foster success. A scientist that had a creative hobby was more likely to win a Nobel Prize than a scientist who was just a regular scientist. Now, the problem I had is since I was weird, how did I sell my work? Well, what I learned to do is I sell my work, not myself. So I would simply show off pictures of my chops. And this next slide shows the dipping vat project that I designed. And I'd put the drawings out there and people go, wow, you did that. And then I've got another slide of another project. And I used this slide to sell the, um, one of our very large meat companies to have me design uh, the front end of all of their big meat factories. And I sent them that drawing. Next slide shows a curved cattle handling facility. That was one of the pictures I put in my portfolio. So basically what I did is I showed off the drawings, showed off the pictures. The next slide shows the dipping vat system I designed for on um, that were shown in the, in the HBO movie project I did back in the 70s. The next slide shows my brochure. It's not in color because in the 70s, uh, colored printing was extremely expensive. So I had a real professional brochure. I just showed people what I could do. I want to show some more pictures of jobs. Um, uh, here's another slide labeled half the cattle in North America handled in systems I designed. And then I got two black and white slides of the dipping vat system. Um, a lot of stuff was black and white in the 70s because it was so much cheaper. Now, what worries me is that our educational system, I think screening out a lot of smart kids. Us visual thinkers, we absolutely can't do algebra. But the thing is, engineering needs visual thinkers because engineers calculate risk, but I can see risk. And when I found out why Fukushima burned up, I was just shocked. Simple watertight doors could have saved it. 
You see, I see the water coming in there. The mathematician doesn't see it. He doesn't see the water flooding the basement, drowning the electrically operated emergency cooling pump. I can't design a nuclear reactor, but I do know electric motors don't run under water. You know, it's that simple. Next slide um, talks about the Boeing um, Max airliner disasters. Engineers calculate risk. I see risk. Uh, and engineers like their jargon, impact with terrain, that's jargon for crashing. Okay, the next picture shows a picture of an airliner and that arrow is pointing at this little tiny fragile thing that's no bigger than this pencil sticking out of the plane. It's called an angle of attack sensor. It measures whether or not a plane is going to stall. Normally, that just acts as, a, as an instrument to inform the pilot that he's in danger of stalling. But Boeing went, hooked this very fragile thing that a bird can just rip off a plane directly into the plane's flight controls. And they forgot to tell the pilots. This is really basic here. And I look at that and I go, you wired that thing to the flight controls and didn't tell the pilots? Yes, the bird rips it off. What do you think happened? And the pilots are back on the, the plane thinks it's stalling. So the computer's shoving the nose down like this and the pilots are going like this back on the yoke and the, you know, the plane crashed. It was a disaster. Uh, and I wouldn't have made that mistake. I would have seen that. The next slide just shows a big food processing plant. I'm concerned in that, which in a lot of places we're taking the skilled trades out and we need skilled trades in engineering. I was watching some very interesting videos just the other day on making big turbine blades. They had the coolest scaffold for building the tower for the turbine. Well, probably someone's a visual thinker made that scaffold. Also the layering on all the fiberglass and the, and the, and the graphite fiber fabric really intricate process. If it's done wrong, the blade's probably going to break. Um, real, real interesting. We need our visual thinkers. So the thing I learned on building large food processing plants, who does it? The degreed engineers would do things like boilers, refrigeration, make sure the roof isn't going to fall down. But the visual thinkers like me, we did things what I, what I call the clever engineering department. Think packaging equipment all of the really clever kinds of things. And these people are not getting replaced. That's the problem. And I, in fact, uh, Holland and uh, Germany, they've been shipping a lot of very expensive food processing equipment over to the US because we're not making it anymore. And what's caused this is um, taking um, welding and shop class out of the schools 25 years ago, paying for that, big mistake. Don't do, you're probably doing that in the UK too. Now the next um, slide, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about thinking before wrapping it up. Um, computers, artificial intelligence, autistics, ADHD and dyslexics were bottom up thinkers. In other words, you take a lot of specific examples and you put it into categories. Top down thinkers tend to overgeneralize. Okay, we've got kids with this label, then we just assume they can't do anything. Um, for me, I understand specific examples of different things. So how do I learn something like good and bad? Well, if I put gum on the teacher's chair, that's not robbing a bank. You can have different degrees of something being good or bad. I hold the door open for somebody, that's really, really nice, but it's probably not Mother Teresa. So you can have with specific examples, different degrees of something being good or bad. That's, uh, I had to be taught that. Here are just some tips on kids that think differently. Do not overload working memory. Multitasking is not going to work. When I was learning to talk, I had to be given time to respond. I often have problems in interviews with interrupting, and that's because I don't get the timing right. I have a slow processor speed. But if I was a computer, I'd be an Intel 286. You can look that up online and see what that is. But I got the cloud for memory. I got some great big warehouse full of servers to be my memory. And give the kids checklists for things that involve sequence, like taking apart a machine uh, and, and then you got to put it back together again. Give them a checklist or just a checklist for setting up the cash drawer in a store. Real simple. We also have to take these kids and stretch them just outside their comfort zone and get them doing new things, but give them choices. 
give them choices. And if you've got a problem with noise sensitivity, one of the ways to help kids get over that is give them control of the noise. So if it's something like a hairdryer, let them turn it on and off where they control it. Really important. And we've got to limit the screen time. Now that's really hard with COVID, but we need to be having some time every day where there's going to be no screens. How about a meal with no screens? Because I'm seeing too many kids getting addicted to video games and they're not getting out there and designing them. And we need to have you know, chances, choices to do a lot of hands-on things. This is my book of hands-on activities, Calling All Minds. Um, it's available electronically, so that should make it easy to get if you have to order it from the US. But kids aren't doing simple things like making paper snowflakes. You know, and hands-on things also teach practical problem solving. You know, we're getting kids uh, getting upset if they're not perfect. Now, I think what we need to be looking at, education, is what is the goal of education? I think we need to be looking at where is a child 10 years after high school? I was a lousy student in high school. I had a great science teacher who got me motivated to study because now studying became a pathway to a goal, not just something to please the family, a pathway to a goal. Another thing with kids that are different, we need to be teaching working skills. That needs to start around 11. Maybe a little volunteer jobs, a church or community center. I know that's difficult now with COVID, but they've got to learn how to do a task outside the family. Uh, you know, when I was uh, 10 years after high school, I was doing those dipping vat projects that were shown in the HBO movie. And one of the things that really motivated me is I wanted to prove to people that I was not stupid. That was a really big motivator for me. And I want to see um, these kids get out and be successful. Also, there is scientific research that shows that the different kinds of thinking really do exist. And I talk about that research in my book, The Autistic Brain, that is available in the UK, The Autistic Brain, that the object visualizer and the visual spatial more mathematical visualizer, there's research that shows that they really do exist, these two different kinds of visualizers. And uh, thank you for listening to my TEDx talk. Um, thank you very much.